Thank you for downloading this sermon from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. For more information about Trinity, visit our website at www.trinityspartanburg.com. So now let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to turn to uh, John 8, and we're going to pick up at verse 12 and read through 20. This is the word of the Lord, it is eternally true. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself, your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? And Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we call upon you. Since all fullness of wisdom and light is found in you, mercifully enlighten us by your Holy Spirit in the true understanding of your word. Give us grace to receive it in true fear and humility. May we be taught by your word to place our trust only in you and to serve and honor you as we ought, so that we may glorify your holy name in in all our living and teach our neighbor by our good example rendering to you the love and the obedience which faithful servants owe their masters and children their parents, since it has pleased you graciously to receive us among the number of your servants and children. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. So last month, before... Uh, Christmas, I preached on verse 12, where Jesus says that he is the light of the world. In that sermon, I concluded with this. I said, you who are in Christ have that light. Right? Jesus being the light, if you are in Christ, you have that light. Now, there remains that struggle with your flesh, the flesh and the spirit waging war against one another. But remember, there is no fight in those who walk in darkness. There's no struggle even. They love their bondage to sin and like to stay hidden in darkness. Those who follow Christ, who walk in his light, possess something really uh, almost indescribable. They possess a, an indescribable peace. Even as the world revels in the darkness, even as the fallen world is washed in blood, even as all breaks and disappoints, The followers of Christ, the light of the world, right? They have peace in the midst of all of that. And so what Jesus says here about not walking in darkness, rather living in and and having the light of Christ is especially meaningful given the words he just spoke to that woman who was caught in adultery. Right, which we looked at last time. It's a, it's a continuation of his exhortation to her to leave behind her sin, right? to find peace in the light of Christ. He offers himself to her as the path of freedom from her bondage to sin. And so the balance of her days should be spent Uh, to serve Christ, to enjoy his friendship, and and not to indulge her desires and run after uh, the darkness which which was her sin of adultery. 
He's calling her to the light. He's calling her out of the darkness she's been living in. He's calling her to light. Once again, the Pharisees object to Jesus' statements. That's the, that's the role the Pharisees played all through the Gospels, objecting to everything that Jesus said, right? Even if he had said something that they had said a minute earlier, they would have objected to it, right? Spurgeon likens the Pharisees to wasps who quickly return after being driven away. Just constantly coming back to Jesus, trying to get him. This time, their objection is procedural. And, and less because of the, the content. And Jesus, they say, is breaking the rules. He's breaking the rules. They can't believe his testimony because he's testifying about himself and there are no other witnesses. They, they say that no man should be trusted when speaking on his own behalf. They want some proof from some other place. I mean, they, they want proof from, from, from anywhere else, but Jesus just speaking about himself, they're not going to accept. Now, that's absurd, right? That's absurd because they've had plenty of other witnesses. They've had plenty. Jesus' authoritative teaching, right? His wisdom, his miracles, and then there's that small, little, tiny, insignificant witness of his father's voice testifying from heaven that he is his son at his baptism by John. You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Right? That testimony of the father resonating. Uh, This issue of witnesses is a theme in John's gospel. Remember chapter 5. If you turn back to chapter 5, Jesus said this, agreeing with the principle of the Pharisees in chapter 8. He said, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Right? He's he's already asserted what what they're bringing to him. Then Jesus goes on to talk about many witnesses. Well, there was John. Right? There was John the Baptist who testified of the truth. And then there were Jesus' works, the things that he did, the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So those works are a separate witness. And then there's his Father who witnesses to him. The Father who sent me, he has testified about me. 537. And then finally, he speaks of the testimony of the scriptures. The scriptures, it is these that testify about me. 539. And if you believed Moses, you would believe me. So he's saying, he's speaking about all these witnesses his father, John the Baptist, the scripture, his miracles, his works, the things he's done. All of those have been testimonies uh, to his. Veracity. So you see, Jesus was continually answering these kind of objections from the Pharisees, the Jews, the scribes, the doctors of the law. He had come to his own, and the elites of his own would not receive him. Now, can I say something obvious here? Rejecting the testimony of Jesus and all those other witnesses, rejecting Jesus' testimony and all the other witnesses is what will always mark unbelievers. That that will mark their lives. They will deny the testimony. I mean, you think of progressive Christians, right? Those who have the, the name Christian but don't walk the walk. Right? Progressive Christians are always trying to work a way into heaven that allows people to ignore and reject all of Jesus' testimony, all the things he said. Right? They want to they weasel around these ethical, moral you know, problems in order to uh, make a way in. And so they make Christianity be a broad road 
that leads to life even when Jesus said the very opposite. They will believe what they will believe despite what Jesus told them to believe. They'll believe whatever they want despite what the testimony of God in his word is. And so it's not Christianity. That isn't Christianity. I mean, how could it be Christianity if, if they're rejecting the things of Christ, right? Um, how could it be Christianity when the objective is to find a way around what Jesus has taught? Um, those who are not Christians will continually reject the testimony of Jesus. They will question and question and question and question and question and never settle on Christ or, and that usually looks like they'll never take Jesus just simply at his word, at face value. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they want four or five other ways to come alongside that one exclusive way, right? But this is what we should expect. Those, on the other hand, who are Christians are settled and determined to believe the word of God. That's what will mark the Christian. You are settled and determined to believe every word in this book. And Christians do so because the Spirit has opened their eyes to the absolute veracity of Christ's testimony in his word. There comes a point when the regenerate soul has a disposition toward the word that moves from hatred to love for every one of God's commands. That's what happens in the regenerate soul. You go from, man, bleh, no way am I going to give that up, to, oh, God has said it. It is his character. I love God. I will follow it. All right? There comes a point when a when, when the regenerate soul has a disposition toward the word that moves from hatred to love for every one of God's commands, the unbeliever, though, will just go from objection to objection. The Pharisees, in other words, are revealing the hardness of their hearts. They're revealing that their hearts are completely hard. And anyone you hear grumbling and complaining about the testimony of God in the word is also revealing their own hardness of heart. Well, the word of God, it confronts us, right? And it's a hammer. It's a fire. It is, it is hard. But the Christian says, well, cut me and hammer me, right? And... Especially if it means I will leave behind sin and be holy as God is holy. The unbeliever objects and objects and objects to the testimony of the word and cries, unfair, unfair, unfair. We're just human. And when the spirit works in the hearts of a man, in the heart of a man, the, one of the, the main proofs is that they no longer object to the word. They simply cling to it. They love it. And they love it even when it, it annihilates them. It's interesting to me how today we, we laud and we praise doubt. You know? Isn't it interesting how, how we, we praise doubt? As if that's the doubt is the height of the, the of spiritual pursuits. I mean, it's all hipster Christians do, right? It's what hipster Christians do is just talk about sanctified doubt. They think it is spiritual to question and question and question and question and then never settle on Christ and then never submit to His Word, right? They use sophistication to uh, skirt every obvious teaching of, of Scripture. Everything is a struggle, and it's a battle, and it's confusion because, you know, our brokenness. And the spiritual man today is not the one who fixes his hope on Christ. 
the one who hangs his hope on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? The spiritual man today, it seems, is, is the one who opposes on principle the call to work out one's salvation in fear and trembling. The spiritual man today is the man who presumes upon the grace of God and honestly sins so that grace may abound. The hipsters are incessantly talking about grace, right? And yet all depressed and despairing. How does, how does that make sense? All they talk about is grace, 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 grace. They avoid the law. They never preach convicting sermons, right? They don't shoot for the heart. And then they all talk about how depressed they are. And how it's necessary then to um, have a hobby of craft beer, you know, to kill the pain. Right? Giving, and they, and they give, they, they think it's important to, to laud those who, whose approach to the word is one founded on unbelief and doubt. Right? The philosophers, whatever it may be. And that's what, that's the sort of, that's, that's what the PCA became. Hipster Christians, you know, sanctifying doubt, questioning and questioning, being progressive, trying to work around the obvious teachings of God's word. How can that be? How, how can it be that we, uh, we at times are like that, brothers and sisters, unceasingly talking about grace but then unable to get out of bed in the morning. Unceasingly talking about the grace of God and depressed at the same time. It's not because we are mourning the sinfulness of mankind, right? Our depression doesn't arise from like Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus grieving over sin. Right? Very seldom do we ever get that cosmic, right? Right? Um, we're not depressed because we're mourning the sinfulness of mankind, weeping as we look on the lost. We really don't care that much to our shame. It's likely because, you know, talking about grace and still being depressed, it's likely because we haven't properly repented of our sins. We haven't done the hard work of confession and prayer and mortifying and fighting and relying on God's provision of the way of escape. Instead, we just recast God as a benevolent pushover who doesn't require any repentance or any rigor in the Christian life. And that's cheap grace. Right, that's cheap grace. That's, that cheap grace leads to depression because it is Jesus without sanctifying power. That's what it is. It's Jesus as a rabbit's foot, but without any power. It's Jesus without the Holy Spirit, in a sense. It's promised grace without actual grace. Because we speak of it all the time and do not see the fruit of it, we have become, we have grown accustomed to grace. All of our talk of grace makes us think God is near to us when our lives, our living, seems the very opposite. Our affections are no different than the world's. Right? Our pursuits, our loves, our pride, all very similar to the world's. And grace, grace is our talisman then. Grace is our dope. It's the dope we smoke. Right? But we are not experiencing the radical power of God's grace. Grace without sanctification is the lazy man's right, microwave dinner. It's quick, it's effortless, but it is unsatisfying. <laughs> you know? I mean, maybe some of you like microwave dinners. I don't. But that's, that's grace without sanctifying power. Right? That, that, is, that leaves us incessantly 
speaking positively about grace and then waking up depressed in the morning because our sins are still the same. Our sins, the things we go after, are just identical every day, and we make no progress in the faith. So let's not skirt around the commands of God, even in the name of grace. When God speaks, he expects us to obey. Remember what the Apostle John says. He he tells us to obey God. The Pharisees... Hearing Jesus should have obeyed their creator here. They did not. But the apostle says this in his epistle. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And that just blows off the head of all the hipster Christians. They're like, how could the apostle John like put forward that standard of perfection? And I mean, that's a denial of grace. That's legalism. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, says the apostle. And as an afterthought, after that thesis statement, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now that doesn't sound cheap, gracious, does it? If the passage were written by today's, you know, hipster Christian, the, the first sentence would not appear. It would be, try not to sin, but if you do sin, there's an advocate. He says, I'm writing to you so that you will not sin. But if you do sin, there's an advocate, right? It's, the goal is to not sin, And yet that is not the emphasis. Now Jesus now goes on to say that he is in no he is no ordinary witness. He's from heaven. He is God. He is sent from the Father to do the Father's will. He's no mere man. His testimony is not like that of just a mere man. Right? So even though there are witnesses galore, they ought to listen to him simply because he is from heaven and is returning to heaven. The procedural rule of the Pharisees does not apply to God. The Son of God holds a rank above the whole world. For he is not reckoned as belonging to the rank of men, but has received from his father this privilege to reduce all men to obedience to him by a single word, says Calvin. He's God. Jesus is God. And when he speaks, he needs no other testimony. He needs no corroborating testimony. The testimony of God himself is not subject to a man's judgment. If it, it is to be accepted, you know, immediately and without hesitation. If it is not, it's disobedience. These Pharisees had been treating all those sent from God the same way. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. They'd been killing all the testifiers says Jesus, and when the Father sent the Son, they do the same thing. They will not listen. They judge according to the flesh. They will not accept this unimpressive, seemingly ordinary carpenter's son. And then Jesus again reminds them that his testimony is not only trustworthy because he is God, but that his father has testified to him, saying, listen to him. Listen to him. The God they claim to worship is the one who from heaven spoke, testifying to him. These Pharisees were unwilling to accept the testimony of, of two men, in theory, but here they are rejecting the testimony of two persons of the eternal triune God. 
They are blind guides leading the blind. And this statement that his father testifies about him is too much for the Pharisees to take in silence. So they interject that question. Where's your dad? Where's your dad? I mean, they're, they're, that's how I take it. Where's your father? It's translated. But, they, but they're saying, where's your dad? Now, let's not forget this, that we have already seen these Pharisees pick up stones to kill him because Jesus had made himself equal to God. Remember, that has already happened. We went over that months ago. Again, that's back in chapter 5. For this reason, there, uh, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because He not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's after Jesus says, my father is working until now and I myself am working. You remember that? These Pharisees know that Jesus' claim is that he is from God and that his relationship with God is something that is absolutely unique. It's something amazingly unique. So, so unique is it that we, we've spent thousands of years contemplating it and have barely scratched the surface. Right? God the Father and God the Son are one. The Pharisees are not ignorant of this claim. And so when they ask Jesus, where is your Father? You know, they don't, they don't ask, who is your Father? They ask, Where is your father? In other words, they're being sarcastic. They know his claim and they are mocking his claim by asking where his father might be at that time of day. Is he making coffee? Is he eating a sandwich? Right? They're trying to diminish Jesus' claim. And so they make it obvious that they believe he's making up his claim. Where's your dad? Where's your father? And Calvin makes this interesting application based upon that question. He says, by these words, they mean that they do not value so highly Christ's father as to ascribe anything to the son on his account. And the reason why there are so many in the present day who with daring presumption despise Christ is that few consider that God has sent Jesus. If you consider that God has sent the Son. I mean, that's quite clear, isn't it? Fewer today are willing to consider that God sent Jesus Christ. This is our faith. This is what we believe. This is not stories. This is not literature. This is not... Um, this is not eternal truths. This is the, the history of God the Father who created all things, sending his Son to live among us. It's our whole life. We don't care about anything other than that. That's all we care about. It's so wonderfully cataclysmic, right? It changes everything. That's all we care about. But few today are willing to consider that God sent Jesus Christ. Many today form their judgment about Jesus Christ simply on the testimony of their God-hating college professors. Right? Or, I mean, that's, that's almost respectable. Um, many, many form their judgment of Jesus Christ based upon the blind ignorance of our cultural elite. That's worse. Because our cultural elites are, you know... Chloe Kardashian and Richard Dawkins. 
Right? And so, so many, no one's, people bring, suck in those messages and they're unwilling to contemplate. They're unwilling, first of all, to go to the source and contemplate Jesus Christ there. They've, and our cultural elites and our, our, our God-hating college professors, there are non-God-hating college professors, uh, thankfully. Um, some in this room. But, but the, the God-hating type, they have not even read Jesus' words. They, they have not honestly even thought about the implications of a godless existence. They haven't thought about that. They have not once truly stopped to contemplate whether or not Jesus was sent by God. Their rationality won't even let them contemplate that question. It's irrational. Will not compute. Is not important. The rationality forbids them. After all, Lil Nas X and Richard Dawkins and Bill Nye the science guy, right? And the lovely hosts of The View and old man Nietzsche have assured them that Jesus cannot be from God. I mean, oh, barf. And not only can Jesus not be from God, there's not even a God at all. There's no God at all. I mean, we read Psalm 53 this morning, right? Um, And they accept... And they accept their testimony and will not stop to contemplate whether there is a God, whether he is personal, whether, um, and whether because he is love, he sent his son. They won't even read the source, right? They, in, in other words, they accept the testimony of man, but reject the testimony of God. Few today are willing to consider that God sent the son. Again, why? We're stupefied. We're absolutely stupefied by the lies of evolution. Which takes more faith to believe than believing the word of God. Right? We are absolutely stupefied by evolution. We're absolutely stupefied by scientism, right? The worship of science or the worship of rationality, whatever you want to call it. We're stupefied by materialism, aren't we? We all, I mean, we're all tempted because of the the stew we've grown up in to deny anything supernatural. We deny miracles. We deny anything that can't be explained by the five senses. We just live in a a stew of presuppositions about the world. And those presuppositions are that there is nothing spiritual. God entering the world. Not part of our world. God sending a savior. Well, that's not possible in a world without a God. That just came into being because of the forces of Time and pressure and heat and light and time and lots of time and lots more time. And why are we, even the church, stupefied by that kind of materialism? Because it's the basis of everything in our society, it is our culture. We live in a materialistic culture. It is the presupposition behind every part of our culture, every film, every video series, every Netflix series is coming at you with a worldview, right? And it's materialistic and it's non-supernatural. Every book, every advertisement selling you that worldview. And so we breathe in this anti supernaturalistic air all the time. We swim in this sea of, of cultural atheism. And scripture is radically different. 
It says the one who says there is no God is a fool. A fool. And yet our culture says the opposite. The one who says there is a God is a fool. What a bunch of foolish, pie-in-the-sky Christians. But, but, you know, maybe... Maybe I'm giving us too much credit. You know, it, it would be, we could explain our malaise as sort of living in a culture that has great influence over us because they're, they're always preaching their message to us. But maybe it's just because we're lazy. I mean, it's just, we don't take up the word of God. We don't, we don't go after God. We don't think upon and meditate upon the supernatural. We, we just, we're just lazy, right? And so, so being lazy, we don't have any intent to swim against the current. That's, that takes muscles to swim against the current all the time. It's very tiring. But dear brothers and sisters, that tiring uh, against the current narrow way is, is the way to everlasting life. It's the only way to everlasting life. Jesus' Father on that day with the Pharisees and today and every day is there. And because of his long-suffering, patient nature is watching over his creation, waiting for men to repent before he sends his son to strike the nations and usher God's children into an everlasting, beautiful, warm, sunny, restful, peaceful, perfect feast. Or we're just a random collision of molecules. Take your pick. But if you take your pick, live accordingly. Live accordingly. You need to start living your life as if nothing has any meaning. As if love is just a chemical reaction in your brain. Live accordingly. Faith says that, that that picture that is painted for us in Scripture, that beautiful upcoming feast in the presence of God and the salvation of mankind and, and the spiritual reality and the eternal soul, faith says that that is the truth. It will come to pass. God is and he has worked the world in every, uh, in every way expressed in his word which was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then, and then the Pharisees, okay, we come back to the passage. The Pharisees mockingly ask, where is your, where is your dad? And Jesus then says this, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Whoa, okay. That's intense, right? Do you feel the intensity of those words? These are the scribes, the Pharisees, the doctors of law, the leaders of the temple, the, the, the powers of the Sanhedrin. You know, like those who accept the testimony of Bill Nye and Dawkins and John Lennon, these men are ignorant, they're ignorant. Jesus is speaking of their ignorance. They may boast that they know the Father, but Jesus assures them here that the first and most important proof of their knowledge of the Father would be that they accept what he says. That's what he's saying. Right? They may be experts in the law. They may have the people of Israel wrapped around their fingers, right? They may be compelling. They may be handsome even. But they have been shown what they really are here. They will not have this prophet. They will not have this man's testimony. They will not follow 
this Jesus Christ. They will not. I mean, think of it. These experts in the law do not know God. What does it mean to know God? Does it mean to know, know things about him? Does it mean to have information? Does it mean to have read some books of a spiritual nature? Chicken soup for the soul or something like that? Right? Does, does it mean that? No. Does it, does it mean to be a scholar who studies the scripture and, and uh, pours over it like, a, like an, it, it, I don't know. Like, like, some, like somebody doing actuarial work uh, with, with a budget, right? No, what does it mean to know God? It means to, to love him? Is that what it means? To love him? It means to love him and to have a relationship with him. Now, does that, does that sound too touchy-feely? Does that sound like I'm diminishing God to speak about relationship? Don't forget that the triune God is three in one. It is a relationship of persons, right? It is love. It is love. He is love, Right? It means to have a relationship with him. That's what it means to know him. It means to have intimacy with him. It means to commune with him, to speak to him, to love him, to delight in him. It means actually to enjoy him. Right? Do you know God? Do you know God like that? Do you enjoy him? Do you actually enjoy him and wonder at his perfections? Do you know him? This is eternal life, that they may know you, said Jesus, speaking of his Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's in John 17. This is eternal life, that they may know you. So these, so I mean, these these experts, these seminary professors, these um, well-published authors, right, these Reviewed in Christianity Today, authors don't know God. And God is standing right before them. And they don't know God. And so what's the lesson we pull from all of that? It's it's this. Many people believe they know a lot about God, about deity, about spirituality, about transcendence. But Christ teaches us that it is impossible to truly know about God and be ignorant of Jesus Christ. That is impossible. Right? But our pride tells us that we have to discover things about God on our own. We have, to, we have to come to a personal, very personal understanding. We have to search and find God on our own and on our own terms with our own unimpeded brain power and our, and, and our pristine senses. Right, and, and that's the route, brothers and sisters, of concocting a God of your own imagination. That's where that leads. Jesus Christ said that knowledge of God comes by a knowledge of him. Him. One way. And a knowledge of him comes in what way? How does that knowledge come to us? The Apostle Paul writes, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. The word of Christ. 
A knowledge of Christ comes by hearing the word of God, truly hearing and perceiving, not simply hearing, but hearing with understanding, which is a product of the work of the Spirit in man. There is the God of our imagination that originates from within, or there is the God who is written of himself in the word. Those are the two areas that people fall in. The God that they've not concocted, you know, those are usually the people that say, well, my God is, you know, my God would never, you know, crush the Amorites. There is the word of God also coming in the flesh and dwelling among us. So in the end, we either worship the God we've concocted or we follow the God who has spoken. And the Spirit can and will convince all of God's children of this truth. Calvin says, For whoever aspires to know God and does not begin with Christ must wander, as it were, in a labyrinth. For it is not without good reason that Christ is called the image of the Father, as has been already said. The Apostle Paul put it this way, For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It is through the face of Jesus Christ, he who is the image of the invisible God, that we see the Father. It is through Christ's face that we have any knowledge of God. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of the Father's nature. And upholds all things by... The word of his power. And so, the only way to know God is through Jesus Christ. And in that final verse of the passage we are looking at this morning, even though these confrontational words were spoken right in the middle of the the temple, right in the treasury of the temple, the Pharisees were unable to seize him. Right? He was protected by his father's providential oversight. His hour had not yet come. He would continue to preach. He would continue to testify of himself to the world with his father's testimony still resonating in the air. And all those who know God will love and enjoy Jesus Christ. And only those.